All right, I'm going to go through uh, this common source amplifier, which is one of the three most uh, common configurations that we're going to talk about, the other two being common gate and common, common drain. All right, so what this is used for is amplifying a time-varying input uh, that has some meaning. There's some information in the signal. We want to amplify the voltage. We'll see that it also amplifies the current, but we're going to kind of concentrate on the voltage amplification. Uh, and what we want to see is that we get a similar output, the same shape, the same information, just basically bigger in some way. And basically we want the voltage amplitude to be bigger on the output. All right, this looks a lot like some circuits we've seen before. This is the very most, just about the most common, uh, basic common source configuration. So we've got a single transistor here. This is an N-channel MOSFET. There's a source, drain, and gate. And then we've got a variable source here. Now this could be DC plus AC, or it could be just AC by itself. In other words, it's time varying, but since we're going to block the voltage, the, the non changing voltage with this coupling capacitor, um, we really only care about the AC stuff coming through here. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we've got a resistor on the drain RD. Our output is directly on the drain. It's common source because the source terminal with the arrow is tied directly to ground. And then R1 and R2 are used to set up in conjunction with RD. These guys set the voltage on the gate, and we've seen that before both in lab and some of the problems. Anyway, so the Q point, which we'll figure out first, comes from knowing R1, R2, and RD. This stuff over here on the left is all about the input, the input signal, input resistance, and the input cu coupling capacitor. And then the output is, that we see here hopefully looks a lot like what we put in. So that's the whole point of the thing. Okay, so we'll start off with a DC uh, analysis, uh, remembering that uh, the current through a capacitor is related to how big is the capacitor and also how fast is the voltage across it changing. So that's back from 2350. The change in voltage with respect to time, dVdt, that tells you how much current is going through this capacitor. So for the DC steady state analysis, guess what? dVdt is zero, so I don't care how big the capacitor is. Um, if I am only thinking about the DC solution, I'm going to ignore what happens out here for the time being, because I'm only thinking about the DC, the Q point. So therefore, I'm going to treat this capacitor as an open, because I know no current goes through it as far as the unchanging voltage. Uh, so I'm going to treat it as an open, which means for the DC analysis, I get rid of that whole left side. I don't have to worry about what's over there because it is decoupled. It's not connected because that capacitor is open to unchanging voltages. So that lets me just worry about what's going on here with the pieces that are left. And that's R1, R2, and RD. Okay, so what I figure out is, well, the source is grounded. That helps me. That's simpler than... The, the, the test problem we saw before where we had a resistor there. So what we need to know is that there's no current going into the gate, so all the current goes through R1, continues on through R2, and goes out here. So therefore the gate voltage is just this voltage, divide, voltage divider, so it's R2 over R1 plus R2 times VD. Um, the other thing we know about amplifiers, so we, so we can if we can figure out what the gate is going to be straight off the bat, uh, in this configuration at least, the other thing we know is that we're going to use amplifiers in the saturation mode. So we can assume, and we'll check it, but we can assume that this transistor is going to be in the saturation mode. So we know the equation that we want to use for this. Uh, we just figured out how we're going to attack the gate. All we need is those two resistors. The source is grounded. So it turns out for this configuration that the gate voltage is the same as VGS. So that's, that's fine. That's going to be easy. Once we know VGS, we'll use this equation to figure out ID. So we'll know the current flowing through here. Once we know that, we'll figure out what the drain voltage is, which also turns out to be the same as the output voltage, is the voltage at the drain, and that's also VDS. So this one thing is 
got a couple different names. It's V out. It's also V D and it's also V D S because V S is ground uh, is ground. <clears throat> all right. Anyway, we figure all that out by knowing the current going through here. We know that that is going to be whatever the drop is across this resistor, which is nothing but Ohm's law R D times I D. So. What we end up with is, if we want to figure out the Q point, we need to know the gate voltage. That'll tell us the uh, current, and that'll tell us, therefore, the voltage here. So it's, it's the same thing that we're going to see throughout with MOSFETs. We're going to figure out a voltage, and that's going to tell us a current. And from the current, we're going to get the other voltage. And what we usually care about is, how does this voltage respond to this voltage? But it's a voltage to current to voltage conversion. So as we're doing the DC analysis, this circuit is pretty simple. And, you know, at that point, we know the Q point. We'll know the Q point that this thing is going to be at, at which this thing will be. When once we've got those parameters and not before, then we can figure out what's going on with the AC or small signal analysis. So here's the original circuit again. And we're going to think about, OK, how does this look with an AC? Uh, for an AC analysis, a small signal. Okay, well, well we're going to consider, and, and later on we might refine this, but we're going to assume that a significant amount of the signal can get through this, that it's that the DVDT of this thing, which we haven't really defined, but we know it's changing in time, so therefore DVDT is not zero, and we're going to say that that DVDT and that capacitor are both big enough that we can treat this as small compared to these other resistances. So, you know, we're going to treat it first approximation as being a short circuit and saying that the current can go through there without any impedance. Um, if that, you know, if we want to make it more refined later, we might have a small inductance or a small impedance. But for right now, we're going to say that's a direct short. We also have to pay attention to VDD. So whatever it is, it's a DC, typically. It's a DC source, and so its, its amplitude is DC, and, it's, and think about it as plus zero volts AC. So when we go to the AC model, certainly that will be ground or zero volts, but we're also going to think from an AC standpoint, there is zero volts AC at this point. Because we're going to, remember, divide the problem into, okay, figure out everything about the DC solution, and then we'll come back and figure out the AC solution. And they'll be somewhat separate, and then the two answers will combine to give us the total. Okay, so knowing that this is going to be considered an AC ground, at this point VDD is also 0 volts AC, then what we see is R1 goes from the gate to an AC ground, and RD goes from uh, this point to a, the, the drain to an AC ground. So when we draw the AC model, that's what those things are going to do. And then the other thing, of course, is we want to have a small signal model for this, and we're going to need the small signal parameters. So in the next slide, we'll replace that transistor symbol with this, which is our small signal model for it, which says, I know there's no gate current going anywhere, so that's a dead end street, but I do care about the gate to source voltage. And this transconductance parameter, GM, which I, I can calculate once I know the DC parameters, from those DC parameters, I'll figure out the AC parameters, and that guy depends on how much current is flowing. But it says, okay, I'm going to take this voltage multiply it by transconductance, a 1 over resistance, and that's going to turn into this dependent current source. And then if I have a lambda, I'll also have this output resistance that models the fact that if I put more voltage across the drain to source, I'll get more current through the drain to source. And that has to do with those, uh, those lines on the transistor curves not being absolutely flat, but having a little bit of a slope to them. Okay, so what else is there? So you can see that the coupling capacitor that was here, we've just replaced with a short. Vn is still what it is. All the resistors are what they were, but R1 and R2 are now in parallel because they both go from the gate to ground. And then if you see how that's going, 
from the gate to ground, that's R2, and from the gate to an AC ground, that's R1. So now R1 and R2 in the AC model, not in the DC, but in the AC model, these two are in parallel. And the same thing we're going to see that RD goes to ground in the AC model. Okay, so uh, there's RD. It goes from D to ground. R1 and R2 are in parallel because this is now my AC ground. In some cases, it's in the same place as my DC ground, but I'm, I've got a whole different concept about what's going on here. Okay, so what's going on? Uh, first thing I want to kind of keep track of is how does this voltage relate to that voltage? And because I've got a, a source input uh, or signal input, whatever that SI stands for, because I have a resistor here, not all of this voltage ends up being here on VGS. I lose a little bit before it gets basically into the transistor. Um, and that that is basically the voltage divider of this guy and that guy. So this is the combination of R1 and R2 because we said they're in parallel. So VGS is not all of VI, but it's R1 over R1 in parallel with R2 over that thing, which, which has a name, we'll call it RI, um, anyway, plus RSI. So there's a voltage divider that says I lose a little bit of that signal before I get to the transistor, but the rest of it shows up here, and that's my VGS. I also know I can calculate GM, the transconductance, that I need to know to figure out what's going on with this dependent current source, you know, I've got a formula for that, and that, remember, came from basically taking the and, and making a small signal model out of what we already had. So my transconductance is twice the square root of KNID. So you know, that's, that's the simpler way to write it. The other way is uh, 2 times KNVGS minus VTN. Uh, so this is, you know, so that's in the book. Okay, so that gets us how much signal gets from here to here that gets us how much current is this based on this and the final thing is now convert that current back into a voltage and that happens with this current that depends on that voltage that depends on that voltage this current then Kirchhoff's current law says whatever that current is it's got to come from here in parallel with there. So RO and RD they're obviously in parallel and that ID is the same as this ID. So that's the drain current that's going through this thing and part of it is kind of going through this resistor internal to the transistor and part of it is coming through here. So both of these are contributing to it uh, but that turns into this. And remember, if lambda is big enough that you neglect it, and we'll see when this once we do numbers, a lot of times you won't even include this because this is typically a very high resistance, this R sub O, um, <clears throat> and therefore there's not a lot of current through there. You know, those lines uh, typically are kind of flat on the transistor curves. So usually you mostly care about big R sub big D. All right, anyway, the other thing to notice is that this is my AC ground, and if the current is therefore going up, over, and down, there's my loop, and that's the way it is going, because that's the way the dependent current source looks. Uh, that means that I've got a voltage drop from here to here, which means if this is zero, and there's a voltage drop from here to here, then these are negative in the AC world. So they'll be below the AC ground even though you know when we get back out to the load line remember this all of this is happening in addition to the DC term but the voltage on the drain to source or voltage out and these are the same thing in the AC world um, all of that depends on that current going upwards in this diagram and therefore there's a drop from ground to here so therefore there is a negative sign um, when we get to the next slide, we'll see, that our voltage amplification, which is how much shows out on the output with respect to what went in, has got a negative sign 
GM is the voltage to current conversion from this point to that point. RO in parallel with RD is the this current back to this voltage conversion over here. And then this last term is how much of this voltage shows up here. So it's kind of scattered around, but you can see there's a term which is Ri over Ri plus Rsi. And R sub I is again R1 in parallel with R2. That's the input impedance that an AC signal sees. This stuff corresponds to this piece. The GM is that piece right there, and these two are those two. So our total amplification then, it's, it's a negative sign, but what we're interested in mostly is the amplification. So what do these numbers come out to be? If it's bigger than one, then the size of the output is bigger than the size of the input. And the negative sign means every time the input goes up, the output goes down. So the shape is flipped over, but um, you know if we're sampling that with an A to D converter and making decisions on it or amplifying it into a speaker or something, um, none of that really matters as far as the information content. You know, we may be looking for edges, we might be listening for sounds, uh, whatever. Okay, so very quickly, let's go through an example. Um, this is very similar to one in the, at least in the older edition of the book. I think it's probably the same in yours, but we'll go through the numbers. So we've got a circuit. We just take this exact same circuit and we'll put some numbers with it. We'll say that at the top we've got a 10 volt power supply. Uh, R1 is 71k ohms and R2 is 29k ohms, which are sort of random numbers, but you'll see they, they come out to give us a nice... Um, sort of close to one milliamp solution. Anyway, uh, it's a book so we can pick whatever we want. RD is 5k ohms, that's on my drain, and the source input resistor is 4k ohms right here, and I'm going to say that the, the coupling capacitor is big, and what does that mean? It, well, it's big enough that um, when I'm thinking about an AC signal here, it's big enough that I can treat it as a short, as I can treat it as a short circuit that it lets all the current through. And the bigger the capacitor, the lower frequencies that will be true for, and uh, high frequencies go right through capacitors quite easily. So whatever it takes, if I'm doing audio, it has to be bigger than if I'm doing you know, high-speed data communication. Uh, but whatever it is, I'm going to pick that capacitor so I don't lose a bunch of uh, signal in the capacitor. So bigger is better in this case. All right, and then I have to know something about the transistor. What's its turn-on threshold? Again, it's an N-channel MOSFET. Uh, how big is it? You know, what's its channel strength factor? And also, how much channel length modulation, how much fudge factor do I have to think about? So. You know, you can see that this is 1 over 100 volts. As, it, as this 100 volts gets bigger and bigger and bigger, those lines get flatter and flatter. That's already a pretty big thing. So we know that, you know, for compared to our supply of 10 volts, it's going to be, you know, 10% or less is going to be how much that correction factor is going to be. Now, the other thing I want to do before I start this is kind of get myself a load line so I recognize what's going on later. And I know if the supply is 10 volts, that the most voltage I'll ever have across this transistor from top to bottom, I got zero at the bottom and 10 at the top. So even if there's no current flowing through this, so I don't lose any voltage through this resistor, I'd have at most 10 volts from here to here. So that defines how far along the VDS line that the maximum VDS if the current were zero. And then I want to see how much current could I possibly have, and I've got 10 volts and RD is 5k ohms. So the most current I could ever get through that transistor, if it was turned on completely and had a huge channel and was letting all the current through, I'd never still get more than 2 milliamps due to this 5k ohm resistor there. So as I'm doing things, I expect I should never get voltages bigger than 10 volts and I should never get currents bigger than 2 milliamps. So I know that going in. Okay, start with the DC analysis because I got to do that first. 
I've just replaced all this stuff. And that turns out, remember, DC analysis, I don't really care about this stuff over here, but just for completeness, I've got it. All right, well, the first thing I know is that this is grounded. There's no current into the gate, so I've got an easy shot at figuring out what is the gate voltage, which will tell immediately what VGS is, because S is zero, so VG equals VGS. But all I need to do is say that I've got a resistor divider. Um, I'm going to have a certain current through that 71 and 29, which very conveniently add up to uh, 100 K ohms. So that means I have 10 over 100. I've got one tenth of a milliamp going through here. And if I have one tenth of a milliamp going through there, none of it goes that way because it can't get a DC, you know, a, a, an unchanging voltage won't have any current going through a capacitor. And none of it goes that way. That's also sort of a capacitor and nothing's going that direction because that's the gate. Anyway, so everything goes through there and I got a tenth of a milliamp times 29K gives me 2.9 volts at the gate. Okay, that's also VGS. So that's nice and convenient. This is the simplest circuit I could work with. Then I use my saturation equation that says ID equals KN, which if you remember is 0 0.5 milliamps, times 2.9, which I just found VG minus 1.5 squared, uh, 1 2.9 is 1.4 squared. In the book they actually pick it so that comes out to be the square root of 2 and this comes out to be exactly one milliamp, which is kind of cheating, but whatever. It's close to one milliamp anyway. Um, from that, I'm going to calculate, okay, now I can figure out my VDS. My VDS is how much current is going through here? Well, about a milliamp. It's not exactly, but so I lose about five volts from here to here. Uh, it turns out to be uh, really, I'm, I'm dropping 4.9 volts there. So what? I end up here is 5.1. Okay, well, what I've neglected so far is that lambda. Remember, lambda is how much more current I get through here uh, because there's voltage from here to here, rather than just looking at, it doesn't care how much voltage is across here. It only cares on how big the channel is. There is a little bit increase, which I think you saw in lab, uh, as you get more voltage. Okay, so I'm just going to treat that as a fudge factor I'm going to put on top of the thing I already calculated of 0.98, and that's 1 plus lambda times the voltage VDS, and what I get there for is it's about a 5% correction to that 0.98, and that comes out rounding off a little bit, but it's 1.03 milliamps. So it turns out, I mean, this is very still very close to about a milliamp. You know, you were about 2% low, um, below one milliamp before, about three percent above now, so that's down in the second or third decimal place. Anyway, I've got about a milliamp going through this thing. Let's check and make sure that I'm in saturation. So I've got a 1.03 going through 5k ohms, so that's a 5.15 uh, volt drop here which means I don't quite have 5 volts here anymore. I've got 4.85, but anyway, it's about 5 volts. Remember that this is at 2.9, and the threshold is 1.5. So I've got 1.4 volts of channel. That's my, that's my VDS sat is 1.4. So with 5 volts here to here, I've got a lot more drain to source voltage than I do gate to source voltage, especially when I subtract out the threshold. So when I check the uh, saturation condition, I've got plenty, of, uh, plenty more voltage at VDS than I need. So the saturation uh, assumption was, was good. And, and the other thing I can do is come back here and say, well, I've got 1.03 milliamps. And I calculated about five volts, so that's I'm really you know right about in the middle of this load line. I'm about five volts VDS, and I'm about one milliamp, so you know I'm halfway across this load line. And I know I'm not off because I've got current flowing, and I'm pretty far away. You know I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm relatively safely away from that left side where I might think I'm in triode, and that's all. That's what I want to do for the. Uh, for the DC, the Q point, I want to make sure I'm in saturation. 
Okay, once I've got those values, remember this is two problems in one, from the DC analysis, now we know the Q point, and now we can calculate these small signal parameters we need to that have to show up in the small signal model. All right, well, I'll look at the formula for GM is twice the square root of KNIDQ, the Q point. I didn't always write it before, but um, everything I've done so far is just the Q point uh, current. All right, twice KN times 1.03 milliamps. Uh, take the square root and multiply by 2, and I end up with 1.4 milliamps per volt. So that says every time the VGS changes by a volt, and because of the small signal, it never will by a whole volt. But if it changes by a volt, then I would change how much current is going through the transistor by 1.4 milliamps. And so that's a scale factor for my voltage to current conversion. Now the other things I need is what's the that RO that shows up near the output. Well, that's 1 over lambda IDQ. That's the equation for it. So I plug in my values 1.03, and of course I can't plug any of this in. That's why I had to do the DC values first. I got to know this, and then I can plug that in, and it comes out to be 97 k ohms based on 100 volts being the you know, lambda factor, and and how much current I've got. So uh, compared to everything else in the circuit, 97 k ohms is pretty big. So it's like yeah, that's it, it's a big number. So therefore, it's not a lot of current. Therefore, it's close to being negligible. All right, then the input resistance. Um, remember that in my AC model, uh, R1 and R2 are going to look like they're in parallel because they both go to an unchanging voltage source. So that's 71K in parallel. 29K is 20.6. Again, you kind of see the fact that big resistances don't matter much. It's, it's a lot closer to the small resistance than it is the big. But anyway, it's about you know, 20, 21K ohms of... R1 in parallel with R2. All right, so those are the values I'm going to use when I make my small signal model. Remember, my capacitor has kind of disappeared. We're treating it as a short. There's my input. Here's my voltage divider that tells me how much of the signal is going to show up actually getting to the transistor. So that's the first thing I want to figure out. And so I just take 20.6, it's the voltage divider, 20.6 divided by 4 plus 20.6. So that, and that's how much of this signal gets to here, and it's about 84%. So most of it, that, that's good, because I want to, I want that signal to do something other than just burning up in these uh, resistors. So I want it to get to here. All right, 0 0.84 is how much of that signal gets to there. Then I look at the equation I had before with these one, two, three pieces. GM I've already calculated. RO and RD I know from the analysis and that RI over RI plus SI, that's this thing, the 0 0.84. So I've got all the pieces and all I need to do now is put them together. So what I find out is my amplification of voltage, A sub V, which is defined as how big is the voltage on the output compared to how big is the voltage on the input, is minus 1.4, which is the, the GM I calculated, and it's in milliamps per volt. And don't do what I do, which is drop all the units, but I'm trying to fit this on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, times RO in parallel with RD, that's the 5K in parallel with 97K. And the 5K is the real external resistor, and the 97K is the thing we just calculated, which is the internal resistance that is modeling the slope of the uh, transistor lines in saturation. Um, okay, and then 0 0.84 is how much of this gets to here, and that's that Ri, which is 20.6, which is R1 in parallel with R2, so there's a lot of you know, calculations to get to this point, in parallel with R1 in parallel with R2, plus that 4K, that is you know, part of the source input. All right, plugging all that stuff in there, and by the way, you notice that Although I've got a 5K ohm on the outside, that 97K reduces it, but not much. That 4.75 is 5K in parallel with 97K. So we say lambda is sometimes neglected, and this is kind of why. All right, multiply those all out, and what we get is minus 5.6 as how much bigger the output voltage is than the input voltage. So 
had to calculate the DC stuff just to figure out, first of all, where am I on the load line? All right, I got to make sure that I'm in a saturation zone so that I can increase and decrease and see the output voltage change. And second of all, I had to do that so that I can calculate these parameters because I'm going to need those when I get to this equation. All right, so if I put in, if I put in 10 millivolts, I'm going to get 56 millivolts out, right? If I put in uh, 100 millivolts, which is probably starting to push the edges of the small signal, then I, if I put in 100, I get 560 millivolts out. So I've got a gain. I can, I can use this for a, a bio sensor that's listening to my heartbeat or encephalogram or whatever it might be. So that's important. Finally, what we see is the input signal, so it's multiplied by about five, what was it, eh, almost five and a half, six. The current is also multiplied. We didn't talk about it as we were going, but if you think about how much current does this thing have to supply, because typically, and, and I keep coming back to, you know, sensors and things, but, you know, cell phones that have, have to pick up a very weak signal or, you know, medical equipment, whatever it is, very little current has to come out of here because whatever's coming out of here has to go through 4K and then 20.6K. You know, that's the circuit because it certainly isn't going there. That's a dead end. So there's the circuit for it, and it's seeing an impedance of about 25K versus out here, it's an impedance of a little bit less than 5K. So 25K, 5K, there's about five times more current going on out here, even if the voltages were the same. What we've seen is the voltage is five times higher on the output side than it is on the input side. So when you get to the power calculations, if the voltage gets bigger by a factor of five and the current gets bigger by a factor of five, the power gain is therefore about 25. So if you're, you're trying to think about the power getting uh, larger, that's significant also. So you get both voltage, which we're, we're primarily interested in, and but also the, uh, the impedance of the input is high, so it really doesn't take much current to make the whole thing happen, and that's considered a, a current gain. Okay, so that's, that's the simplest of the uh, circuits that we'll look at as far as amplifiers. Common source, amplifier, single MOSFET.